Hi, I'm George. Hi. Hi, Luke. What is your full name, and when were you born? Um, full name, Cornelius George Werner. Born 10th September 1956. Mutata. Well, my father is originally from Costa. He was an uh, attorney. And he ended up working here in Cape Town, that's when he met my mother. Um, around about the time of my birth, he, um, he started a, a practice in, in Flagstaff. How, how old were you when you, when you came to Cape Town? I would have been about, say, three, four. Annually, we'd go and visit family. Without the, without family from my, my father's side, we kind of scattered um, through the Eastern Cape and KwaZulu Natal. Every Christmas, all, uh, the December holidays, in, we'd go and visit some family up, up north. I felt that by the age of 10 years old, I'd seen quite a I'd moved quite a lot of, uh, through uh, South Africa um, because of that, so we, which was cool. It was, you know, I ended up uh, seeing a lot of South Africa, and besides that, uh, I saw firsthand the different cultures in South Africa, mm. which was quite interesting. I didn't realize that that I was seeing this diversity at, the, at that age. It didn't yeah. strike me, it was only late in my life. Wow, I had quite a diverse... Uh, multicultural. Multicultural upbringing, whatever. Yeah. So your, your parents, were they from a particular... Were they particularly religious or were they from a, <coughs> a particular kind of... My, religion? from my mother's side, my grandfather maternal grandfather, he actually he started out as a Methodist minister and early 1920 because of politics he broke away and started his own church okay. the church still exists, it's called the uh, the Fourth Cape from Africa the, the mother church was in District 6 um, the mother church is 97 Bush the story goes that uh, he's um, he's from the what, what is his name, by the way? Um, Joseph John Forbes. So he was quite a a well-known uh, District Six. I know even the Mayo Buya Center wanted some then uh, UWC. At one stage, wanted some member of the as well. So he must. He probably was well known, I don't know. Yeah. And he was a, a patio musician as well. He played something like 21 instruments. Things like oboes and oh, wow. uh, double lead, violins. And uh, I, know <coughs> I had this aunt who was older than my mother and she played a lot, quite a lot of instruments, something like six. Now that I, I, I knew for myself, she played piano, guitar, ukulele, and things like that. And my mother played the piano, and she taught, uh, she actually taught music and art. She was a primary school teacher. Yeah. She taught piano, choirs, and that probably be, would probably be where my my early music influences came from. When the Beatles arrived, she noticed that uh, there was some content in their music. So although she comes from the Bath, Beethoven and all that, she actually found some useful content. So uh, she would buy us these um, seven singles. Every yeah. month, there would be about two or three new yeah, yeah. Our first movies that she took us to were musicals. Elvis Presley, um, yeah. Fred Astaire, and then the Beatles came out with All Days Night, and that's 
we uh, we need to see that and um, that actually made a I think for me was that movie was quite a, a huge influence on me very early we also went through piano lessons my sister and I but I had done the piano lessons very early where, 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 where in Cape Town was this? Where, where are you living at this time? We, we are staying right now I mean, we've been staying in the some Forty, uh, seventy-three. Yeah. Okay. Seventy-three. Oh. Uh, sixty-three, right? Yeah. We 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 moved to sixty-three. We were initially we were staying out in Rondebosch. We uh, were, we were moved out of. Uh, uh, forced to move. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So um, we ended up in this place, which was quite a. The area where the roads weren't made. The, the infrastructure was quite sparse and the uh, the housing was quite sparse as well mm-hmm. and the, the neighborhood was quite a, a very uh, close neighborhood and down the road there was a guy who was into uh, karate and he was a, <coughs> a wrestler and I became his bad boy he was a terrible wrestler <laughs> yeah, he lost all the time. Yeah, but later <laughs> I discovered that that was actually the um, that was actually his role to lose. Oh. His name was the the brute. But this guy, twice thrice a week, go up to him, and we would we go jogging. He was very sporty, and then when we get home, then he would take out his jazz albums. And I will stack uh, the first time I'm hearing uh, Oscar Peterson and yeah. Duke Ellington and uh, Dizzy Gillespie. So he was actually the, let's say, my, my introduction into jazz. Wow. Through the brute. Through the brute. What is your profession, I suppose? What, what would you do oh. about that? Okay. Well, uh, let's say from income. It would normally be around um, 50-50 uh, performer yeah. and educator. I've, uh, straight out of high school, I, I actually stopped music when I was in, uh, when I left high school. I was performing in bands see, since the age of 16. Uh, like, um, actually earning money. Yeah. Um, 50 cents a gig because of that 50 cents a gig I didn't see uh, it as a career Yeah. Oh, music was never going to be my career that I didn't see it as just a part of the, one of the activities like cricket so uh, it was just one of those activities that you kind of liked and you did you don't see it as a career when I was in um, high school I decided, okay, I ended up working uh, for Telcom. They they told me um, I was doing uh, telecommunication. And I ended up after... Well, how old were you at this stage? 18 years old. Okay, okay. So you just left school? Yeah. Okay. And, I mean, the job just came to me, the, the training and things like the, this offer just happened to me. So I had three years of training and then I started working for them and I started teaching. So I was teaching telecommunication, electronics and... But I had this contact, a six-year contact with them. So that was what? Actually, one uh, in February I resigned from them. I left them. Yeah. So um, I went to UCT to study music. I mean, um, computers. Within my second year, I was dead broke. And I was looking for a part-time job, and um, the only job I could get was as a piano player in a band. Okay. And I ended up playing with people like Isi Aradin, who was a guitarist in um, Pacific Express. And he offered me a job, and that <coughs> then we started doing the hotel circuit. I thought when I, you know, I used to look for people as building blocks in my in my music development 
Yeah. He's full of love. Now he's always looking for guys who knew more than, than I. Yeah. And I was an admirer of Ishi and Pacific Express in the, yeah. in the 70s. So I thought I was going to end up playing some jazz rock yeah. type of thing with Ishi. And it didn't work out that way. He was, we were doing top 20 yeah. pop. Yeah. I saw. Uh, hotel, but that's that's what was needed there. But uh, were these hotels in Cape Town or all yeah. over? Yeah. With the Sun International uh, um, in Sutsky, the Petenburg Bay, the Beacon Eye Hotel. But I, it was actually my intention just to to get some money, and then go back and complete my degree in in computers. I was putting the BSc degree on hold. It's so okay, but this is this is quite interesting because you're playing. You, uh, okay, this is like the the, the height of apartheid, 1970s, 80s. Yeah. Was the band that you were playing in hotels? Was it a multiracial band or was no, it, was, it, it was a coloured? Were you limited to but only playing, playing with, with other colours or? Yeah, but the audience was multiracial. But, but the weird thing is that we were play, playing in Fisca at that moment which was the Republic of Suska. Yeah. So it was a, a <laughs> supposedly another country. <laughs> yeah. And there's, uh, there was also um, <coughs> in <coughs> Botswana, there was also, there was the Vendasan, there was... Um, well, in, in, in Baputaswana or Botswana? Baputaswana. Oh, Baputaswana. So you had Mabatusan. Yeah. Um, um, and in Baputa as well, the main one was actually Sun City. Yeah. So I was actually working in South Africa, but in another country. Yeah. There would be these borders. You know. Yeah. You're now in South Africa. You're now in Sisca. You're now in South Africa. Yeah. You know. Like, uh, here you got Sisca, and there's a place called King Williamstown, and King Williamstown didn't want to be part of Sisca, so suddenly you in Cisco, but then you're now in South Africa just because King Winnerstein yeah. doesn't want to be in yeah. Cisco. And then you're out of this. When you leave King Winnerstein, now you're back in Cisco. It was... But you were playing for, for, for multiracial... Multiracial, yeah. Or, or you were playing yeah, for... multiracial audiences. Is it? Okay. Um, in so fact, it was multinational audiences. Uh, I was... Which was quite interesting. So it was part of the learning curve. We, um, in, when we were in Cisco in... We played with the Anatolia Sun, bad Israeli uh, town planners who stayed there. They were Filipino workers, um, yeah. factory workers, Indians, South African Indians coming from from East London. They were the Afrikaner guys, they were the Chorda speakers, the Kurds from the different surrounding, I mean the, the people who attended the casino would come from as far as even Cape Town, because Cape Town was the clo- uh, uh, Amatola Sun was the closest casino for Cape Townians. Yeah. What I find interesting, we had um, we, we were doing about one cabaret or two cabarets a month. What I learned was how to start to read audiences. Yeah. Because we had this mishmash of nations, peoples. And Isi was quite a hip guy. He really knew how to read audiences. And but you also performed in South Africa proper. I mean, yeah. And so when you were b- performing in South Africa, the audience was not multiracial, or were they? Uh, well, you. The actual politics was be- becoming more hectic uh, at the time of the, you know, the, the Rubicon speech and that. Yeah. What I noticed that. The average people becoming more fuller. They obviously could see that the climate has changed, that you can't like oppress this person any longer. So I was playing in um, in Bay Bank for six months. Met was South Africa proper. We were playing at a, a, a place called the Beacon Isle Hotel, which was like a resort hotel. Yeah. And there they had quite a mixed uh, staff. Uh, I could see there in that hotel at that moment that the open policy 
even women in quite high positions in, in, at this hotel. So you, you saw that, and you know, the audience as well were becoming more integrated. And that, that, that would be around about um, 86. Okay. 86, it, it yeah. became more integrated there. But of course, they would go home after the holiday and they probably go back to their separation. Of course, yeah. But definitely the, the mood was changing already um, in, um, in the mid-80s. At this stage, you uh, were playing mainly pop music, is that correct? Yeah. But uh, at what stage? Well, um, in the, um, when I was in high school, I yeah, was playing fusion. Um, I was playing fusion, bang Adam, everything. I played, I was playing bass, guitar, percussion. In the same band, and the band we changed its name. So uh, when we were playing fusion, we were called Dante. When we were playing Lang Adam, we were called Sons of the Season. In Dante, I was more a rhythm guitarist and percussionist. And in Sons of the Season, I was a bass player. So my function changed. And it was cool. I was uh, playing drums as well. And I started saxophone okay. in matric. When I left high school, I had a Yannicke Sawa, which cost brand new, 375 rand. Well, also a tenner? Tenner. Uh, 375 rand. Yeah. Bang. <laughs> so so I think it's now about 40,000 rand or more. Yeah. Probably now. Yeah. People used to circle around this band. He was a, quite a, a hip guy, what's his name, Trevor Parker. He was the pianist in the band. He was the, the, the leader of the band. But he had this network of people that he knew. He knew the shoulders. So I ended up meeting people like Rich Shoulder at a quite a young age. Um, and Footy Shoulder, uh, bass player. Richard's the eldest of the Shoulder Brothers. Then Tony, then Jackie, then Chris, and then Footy, the bass player, the baby. And usually I was learning jazz but in a, a very informal way, I had a problem with it. And probably this is why I became a teacher. Because those guys couldn't really uh, explain to me yeah. the theory behind the stuff. And I, know that I, I knew at that time, already I knew there had to be a theory. For this thing to make sense, there has to be a theory. But these guys had their own built-in theories which worked because their music was sounding great. So they had to have a a working boating theory. Uh, I can recall um, Trevor Parker telling me, um, hey, you just received this leak from Chris Shoulder. And the leak turned out um, to be the sea blue scale. But he, he thought it was a leak. He was just playing this blue scale. So okay. to me it was a leak. And I'm, okay, let me play this leak up and down. Um, because Trevor told him, and it sounded nice because see blue sky yeah. sounds yeah. nice. And he got this from Chris Shoulder. But Chris Shoulder got it from a guy called, what's his name now? Uh, Combrink, Dennis Combrink. Now Dennis Combrink actually studied at Berkeley. So Dennis Combrink, he was an alto player, and a white guy. He could have played, uh, he could have played piano or whatever. And yeah, I think he was a teacher that in the 60s. So he brought that knowledge from Berkeley to South Africa and he taught it to Chris as a leak or maybe Chris understood it as a leak. Yeah. And he told um, Trevor Parker that it's a leak and Trevor Parker told me it's a leak. It was only about five or six years later that I discovered it was, it was the blue scale. Um, also, during that time, I was in, could have been 72, I was practicing in the same mishmash type of band, it was either Lang Arum or Fusion or Pop Band, and I was practicing with Richard Childer. One of the tunes that we were practicing was You Are the Sunshine of My Life, yeah. uh, Stevie Wonder, and there's an introduction. And Richard turns around and he says, that's the whole tone scale. And I said, wow, okay, here's something new. 
and he explained to us what, what was Raoult on scale. In my search for um, music theory, I was trying to teach myself um, from the Raoult School of Music and um, from books. Yeah, the Trinity. But that theory didn't work for me. That old classical, uh, the way we were taught music through the Trinity College and that I think was very... Uh, the whole world stop, stopped doing that. Up to today, in South Africa, we're still using that Trinity and Royal School and UNIFA. And uh, the rest of the world has, has, has moved on already. And it's no longer acceptable over, over there. I knew about the, the major scale and the minor scale. And yeah, but it's, it's new thing, damn, it, uh, the whole tone scale. And Latin started me thinking that, damn, there must be some other information out there. And, and, and this guy, Richard, actually had the information. And it was an auto yeah. thing, and a very practical, it was basically OBE. Outcomes based education through a tune, he could explain to me, he could explain to me uh, a theory. Did you decide to become a teacher or did you kind of fall into it? Well, I fell into it. At Calcom, I was teaching there for two and a half years, and I didn't, but I didn't want to be a teacher. And I returned to Cape Town in you know, about 80, the start of 87. I had to come back, I thought I had to come back. My sister had just immigrated to Canada. And I told my mother, she was, she had retired by then. I think so, yeah. And I didn't want her to be um, alone because in Cape Town our family is quite small. I was slightly pissed off by the way because I had been offered a gig in Germany. So I had to give up the German gig to come home. But I was about nine, late, late, 1980, I met Merton Barrow. I used to go to the jazz workshop. And it was a nice music community there. We, I used to sit here almost twice, twice a, a week, up till about 10, 11 o'clock in the evening. Mm. Within Bridge Street, Cape Town. Yeah. And uh, this is where I met people like, uh, okay, quite interesting guys. Um, Soft landing, with, uh, uh, Nick Carter, the genuine Scott yeah. coming there, and uh, um, what's this guy? He teaches at uh, Tut, Kevin Davidson. I ended up playing in year yeah, ensemble, quite a hectic ensemble. Uh, three uh, uh, three alto saxophones, bass, drums, and piano, and I was quite. Because my, my first instrument was actually guitar and bass, and I just migrated to piano about two years before that. I was all this, we call it a um, fly ship. There was so much written, it looked like a fly ship on the paper. Kevin Davidson, his compositions, pages and pages, and quite avant-garde. I mean, there was, there was this one piece um, which had kind of lines over the the ball, uh, the stage. I asked him, what, what the heck is these lines? He says, no, I, I need for you to karate the piano in those areas to that rhythm that I wrote. Yeah. So he wanted this ka 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 yeah, ka yeah, yeah. But it sounded quite interesting. Then I, uh, I was playing in you know, ensemble with Merton. Merton had ensemble there. And there was a big band I was playing in that big band. There was a guy called Andre Abrams, mm -hmm. the bass teacher. And we hung out as well, and we, you'd go with into the jazz world, you'd be looking for a bass player, and you you listen, and oh, there's a nice bass sound coming out of that room, you walk in there, and then, then you introduce yourself later, and say, man, I've got a band, I'd like to join. This was like the early 80s. Yeah. That was what was happening at the jazz workshop. And I got to know Merton and Cynthia fairly well. Now, I got to Cape Town in 87. I actually wanted to finish off my degree. And I didn't get a chance. I ended up playing in the District 6 of Musical. Remember that mid-87, mid Merton was trying to get me to teach. I said, oh, Merton, I 
from the teach and things like that. But towards the end of the year, uh, the beginning of eight, eight I told them, okay, let me go and let me go and try out this teaching thing. Now, so I went to my and I said, okay, um, let me let me try it out. So that's how I got into the teaching. Yeah. And I found that I learned more when I was teaching because now I need to teach somebody something, then I go and read up on it and to make sure that I have all my facts right. I ended up doing a, trying to teach people the way I was taught, OBE yeah. method, yeah. Uh, and using tunes to explain theory. So because of that, I had to write out the tunes myself, transcribe it myself. Yeah. And I always would want to find tunes which were very uh, on the scene, in the air at that moment. Um, contemporary. Contemporary, that's right, yeah. yeah. And uh, a lot of the contemporary music, it was, it was Elton John, Elton John, Billy Joel, Michael Jackson, um, a couple other good artists, which actually had some content. I could teach uh, the kids music using contemporary uh, pop music. So were the majority of students at the jazz workshop then uh, children? That 50%, and that 50% was mainly um, affluent white piece. I was learning, so I, I was transcribing music, mm. which I I used it later in life. 